Good afternoon, and welcome to the American Floral Endowments Grow Pro webinar series. I'm your moderator, Michael Wojcinski, and I'm an assistant grower for Bell Nursery in Springfield, Ohio. I help oversee and manage the production of a wide variety of ornamentals for hundreds of stores across the country. Today's session is on diff and graphical tracking. On behalf of the endowment, I'm excited to be part of AFE's Grow Pro webinar series that features a new topic every month presented by an industry expert. The webinars are free to everyone thanks to the support generous support of AFE sponsors. If you'd like to learn more about our sponsors, or if you're a supplier and interested in becoming a sponsor for a topic, you can find that information on AFE's website at endowment.org slash GoPro. Today's session was pre-recorded in English by Dr. Royal Hines. After the presentation, Dr. Hines will join us for a Q&A. Feel free to submit your questions throughout the Q&A feature or chat at any time. We'll answer as many as we can before the end of the hour. Unanswered questions may be answered through a separate email exchange. This session is being recorded and will be shared to AFE's YouTube account. Through YouTube's accessibility features, you can access closed captions in other languages. To get us started, I'd like to share about a bit about today's expert speaker, Dr. Royal Hines. At Michigan State University, Dr. Hines has taught courses in crop production and greenhouse environmental physiology. His major research interests were flowering physiology, the quantification of plant responses to the environment, and the development of decision support tools for growers in the greenhouse industry. From this research, he has authored and co-authored 130 scientific articles or conference proceedings, and over 260 extension and grower articles. He has spoken at over 155 grower meetings and 25 scientific meetings. Dr. Hines has many research accomplishments and contributions in thermomorphogenesis, modeling and decision support, poinsettia growth and development, Easter lily growth and development, seedling storage, herbaceous perennials, and orchids. Royal Hines, welcome, and thank you for presenting today on diff and graphical tracking. Hello, my name is Royal Hines. I'm Professor Emeritus from Michigan State University and Adjunct Professor at Utah State University. Today, the goal is to talk about managing crop height with diff and using graphical tracking for managing height as well. We'd like to start off by saying height control and management of height is critical to production of floricultural plants. Um, it's quite obvious these mums are too tall, these poinsettias are too tall, and this mum is, in fact, too short. What are the things we can do with respect to managing temperature and then a decision support tool to help ensure that a crop finishes at the right height on the right date. And let's start off by talking about what are the methods that we have to control uh, stem height. And we start off with talking about what are the things that promote elongation in plants. Well, first thing we can use are chemicals such as gibberellins. We can use far red radiation that comes from, uh, it could be now LED lamps, but historically it's been from incandescent lamps. We can use high phosphorus nutrition, and finally, we can use positive diff. In a moment, we'll talk about what positive diff means. What do we do to control stem elongation or reduce the amount of elongation that occurs? Classically, and most often as growers, we use growth retardants. We have a wide range of materials that we could use to apply to limit stem elongation. In the controlled environment world, both blue and red radiation produce a shorter plant than radiation, for example, that comes with, um, from, say, an incandescent lamp um, with far red radiation. Low phosphorus nutrition, uh, work by Paul Nelson um, and his students a number of years ago showed that low phosphorus nutrition, very effective at controlling plant height. And finally, we have this term, negative diff. So we have a number of tools. Today, our focus is primarily going to be on the use of temperature through the use of the concept that we call diff for height control. Before we go down that path, I always think it's useful to know what's the history um, behind a concept. And I'd like to take a moment and discuss where and how did the diff concept originate, because this now goes back a little over 40 years ago when I was at Michigan State University. And many people, many of you perhaps today that are listening, weren't even born at that time. And so let's, let's go back in history for a moment. When I started at Michigan State University, I started off with a question, would short-term photosynthetic maximization lead to whole plant optimization? And I had a graduate student by the name of Stan Schumacher, and here he is in 1980 doing some photosynthetic measurements. His data showed that 
as PPFD, as our light intensity increased, the optimum temperature for maximum photosynthesis, the, the temperature increased and our CO2 concentration increased. And using this information, um, years truly, many, many years ago when I was much younger, um, using the, some of the early computer equipment, something called an Exidy Sorcerer, most of you never heard of, um, don't even know they exist anymore, but we programmed this computer to control a cerebral greenhouse sections at Michigan State University. And we tried to apply these principles using short-term photosynthetic maximization, adjusting temperature, adjusting carbon dioxide in each of these chambers to determine if we um, adjusted them dynamically during the day if we would have a better quality, in this case, chrysanthemum. Well, what we found was that optimizing or maximizing the photosynthesis resulted in, in unacceptable, I'll use that term, um, horticultural plant development for the floriculture world. Today, if we were growing tomatoes, cucumbers, cannabis, whatever it happens to be, the idea of optimizing photosynthesis makes sense because yield for these plants um, is a function of photosynthesis. We start with one plant in floriculture, we end with one plant. That plant has to have the right quality characteristics in order to, uh, to be sold. What we found is when we optimized both temperature and CO2, that we wound up growing plants, now this is without growth regulators at the time, grew plants that were excessively tall for the container that we were growing the plants in. So what we found was that this photosynthetic optimization where we, we actually had thick stems, thick leaves, we had great looking plants, they were simply too tall. And we were saying, what's going on here? What is going on here? We brought on a student, Miriam Carlson, um, from Sweden. And Miriam completed her master's way back in 1984, PhD in 1987, and her goal was to model chrysanthemum growth and development. Well, this is Miriam a few years ago, about 1985. Miriam's now a full professor at the University of Alaska and continuing her work in the area of floriculture. Miriam conducted some experiments, and we used something called, uh, at that time, a central rotatable composite design. Um, for most of you, you don't care about that, but it resulted in us growing plants under temperature combinations um, that we never would have ordinarily grown them under. And in this particular statistical design, you wind up having combinations of light temperature, light day temperature, night temperature, that in some cases were counterintuitive. So here one of our treatments was that we used a 14 degree day temperature, which is just under 60 degrees day, and a 26 degree night temperature, which is about 77 degrees Fahrenheit. So we had a cool day and a warm night. And you scratch your head, or intuitively back in those days, we'd never think about growing plants with a cool night and a warm day. But because of the experimental design, that is what we needed to do for the modeling work that Miriam was doing. What Miriam found was that plants grown with a cool day and a warm night were significantly shorter than plants grown with a warm day and cool night. That was the first just general discovery that we saw. Cool days, warm nights, warm days, cool nights, uh, difference in, in height. She published this research and uh, what we found as total plant height, total shoot length, um, had an interesting curve here, interesting relationship. First of all, as day temperature increased, there was an increase in plant height universally um, as the plants, um, as the temperature increased. As temperature at night increased, initially we had a decrease in stem length and then followed by an increase in stem length. Ultimately, the reason for this was because the, at some temperature, we wound up having more internodes on the plant. And so this increase was due to more internodes, delayed flower induction, um, versus uh, just a straight night temperature response. At that time, I was working with a, a grower, um, Andy Mast, in Grand Rapids, Michigan, and he grew a lot of Easter lilies, and Andy asked the question to me, will Easter lilies remain short if grown with a low day temperature? Um, so this picture of Andy back in the um, early 80s, um, had an opportunity to see Andy uh, just a few weeks ago um, in Grand Rapids, and here's Andy. And Andy's big, big influence on us going down this path um, of understanding temperature because of the question he asked. And so using the same temperature combinations that Miriam had used in her research on mums, we grew plants at different combinations of day and night temperature. 
And what we found was that when we had a high day temperature and a low night temperature, the plants grew tall. When we had low day temperature relative to night temperature, the plants grew short, as you can see here. One of the things you also see here is there's a difference in timing of these plants. So plants grown with a very high average day temperature flowered earlier, obviously, than plants grown with a low average daily temperature. So these type of comparisons, you almost have to wait to the end of the crop to see where the plants wind up, because at any one point, um, you may reach an incorrect conclusion. But for sure, in the case of lilies, growing the plants with a cool day and a warm night resulted in shorter plants at flower and maturity, as we see here. John Irwin comes along. John uh, got his master's and PhD with me. John's now an important man. He's a professor and chair at the um, uh, University of Maryland. So John has been very productive over his career. But John single-handedly has contributed more to our understanding of how day and night temperature influence uh, plant morphology than any other person, um, any other person, period. John took and grew plants at, at temperatures from 14 to 30 degrees during the day, 14 to 30 degrees at night. He had five day temperatures. He had five night temperatures, which resulted in 25 treatments. Give John a lot of credit. John would go in every morning, and he would take plants from the night temperature greenhouses and move them to the day temperature greenhouses. There were 25 combinations, so he'd move five He'd move plants from each of these night temperatures to each of the day temperatures. And then at the end of the day, he'd come back and he'd do the opposite. Dedication, for sure, on John's part, seven days a week, moving plants between these five greenhouse sections and five different temperatures to give 25 temperature uh, combinations. <clears throat> As the plants came into bloom, John took those plants and placed them in a cooler so that when they all finally flowered up here, the last plant flowered, Actually, 14, 14, this plant right, right here. It's actually not quite in flower in this picture. But basically, he took this picture. And what John saw was very interesting. First thing was he, when he lined up the plants to take a picture, when we have a fixed night temperature, this was about 65 degrees Fahrenheit, as you increased day temperature, plant height increased in a nice linear fashion. When he took plants that had a fixed day temperature, and looked at what happened as night temperature increased, he saw that the plant's height decreased. This was consistent with the data that Merriam had collected. This was the consistent with the data that we had observed on the plants in that experiment that Andy Mask asked us to conduct. What was really interesting then, though, then though, though was when John lined up plants with, an, with a similar day-night combination, he called me and said, Royal, Royal, look at this. It's all the plants were the same final height. There was, yeah, wow, look at that. Um, all the plants, when this day and night temperature was the same, the final height of the plants was the same. He took other combinations. Here we have the day temperature, 4 degrees centigrade, cooler than the night temperature. 14, 18, 18, 22, 22, 26, 26, 30. These plants flowered at different times, but when they all came into flower, basically they were the same height. The same thing when he did the other way, except these are now all taller. So what John was finding was when the plants had the same relationship between the day and night, they flowered at essentially the same final height. He went further. Here we have an eight degree difference between day and night temperature. And in both cases, the plants are very similar in final height. He then plotted out, he plotted out the final plant height versus what he termed the difference. He said this difference is important. And what he found was that the plant height was related to the difference between day and night temperature. And so as you went from a cool night, warm day, or from a, excuse me, a cool day, warm night, to a warm day and cool night, the plants became progressively taller in a nice continuous relationship. He coined the term diff for difference. And that's where diff comes from. It's this relationship, day minus night temperature. And as we look at this picture, we can see that there's a strong relationship. So anytime we grew, in this case, lilies, and we'll see in a moment this applies to essentially all plants that we grow. As we increase our day temperature relative to our night temperature, we get more stimulongation. So 
Positive diff is defined as the situation where the day temperature is greater than the night temperature, day temperature, night temperature. Negative diff is the opposite, when day temperature is cooler than night temperature. And zero diff, if we use zero diff here, if we type that in here, that would be when day temperature equals night temperature. So, some conclusions that he reached. Positive diff, plants are taller, and the more positive, the greater the stem elongation. Negative diff, plants are shorter, and the more negative the diff, the shorter the plants, and it occurs because of a reduction in internode length. Not internode number, just simply internode length. Here's an extreme example from John's um, research. Here we have a 14 degree day. That's about uh, 50, what is that, 58? 50, about 57, 58 degrees and 86 degrees at night versus 86 during the day and um, 58, 57 at, at night. Huge differences. If you give these plants 12 hours of each temperature, they'll flower at the same time, but the morphology is very different. So the first thing we knew we observed was the difference in height. Other things we observed as we ex exposed plants to different diff combinations was a change in leaf orientation and likewise a change in chlorophyll content, especially in the younger leaves of the plants. So here we have an example um, of a plant, a plant's grown under a strong, here we see negative diff. Notice that we have here a 14 degree day. And as we go from, this is a zero diff here, this would be um, minus four, minus eight, minus 12, and minus 16. Temperature, or the, the height response that we expect we're seeing, but notice also the leaf orientation here versus here. And this was one of the responses that we saw the strongly, um, strong response that you see in an Easter lily. Many other plants, we see a similar response, but perhaps not as strong as we see in the case of the lily. On the other side, we go to positive diff. Here again, 14 degree night, 14 degree the day. This, when we scan these slides, they got cut off a bit. So this is zero, plus four, plus eight, plus 12, plus 16. Once again, positive, more positive diff, taller plants. But also notice how our leaf orientation becomes more upright as the positive diff increases. Classic response we see in lilies, and to a certain extent, most other plants will see the same type of response. Here's the extreme from minus 16 to plus 16 on diff, the difference in height, but also the leaf difference in leaf morphology and orientation. An Easter lily crop grown in the greenhouse under negative diff, when you walk out there, you'll typically see the young upper part of the plant looking chlorotic. It's not a nutrient deficiency, it's simply a lack of chlorophyll synthesis. Our best thinking on this is that we have a situation where we, when we think about chlorophyll synthesis or chlorophyll accumulation, at any point in time, at any point in time, let's go here for a second, any point in time, in a plant we have chlorophyll synthesis and we have chlorophyll degradation. We know, we know if we put a plant in a closet in the dark, over time, that plant will become chlorotic and the chlorophyll degrades. Night temperature, we have a degradation of chlorophyll. Day temperature, we have a synthesis of chlorophyll. Both of these processes are biochemical processes and temperature dependent. So as we increase our day temperature, we increase the amount of chlorophyll that we synthesize. As we increase our night temperature, we increase the rate of degradation. So under negative diff conditions, we have a cool day and a warm night. So we have increased our degradation at the night, we've reduced the synthesis, and we wind up having a chlorotic plant independent of nutrition. We can spray these plants with iron, we can drench them with iron. They're not gonna have a darker green color. The other end down there, we have a plant with the opposite and we have now, down here, we've promoted synthesis and we've reduced the degradation. So we accumulate chlorophyll and the plants are dark green. So classic response to diff is this chlorosis we see on the younger leaves under negative diff conditions and dark green color under positive diff conditions. This picture I put here 
to show that the response to temperature occurs daily when we grow plants. We took plants and grew plants at a constant 20 degrees C, 68 degrees Fahrenheit. Every day, we took plants and moved some to a minus 10 degree diff and some to a plus 10 degree diff. We did this for a week. At the end of that week, seven, 14, 15 treatment combinations. We got all the plants and lined them up. And what you see is this continuum here of shorter plants, more chlorosis, more pendulous leaves, and the opposite as we go in the opposite direction. Even one day, even one day, look at this, or we look at this, even one day, negative diff, one day at positive diff, we can see the difference in the plants. So plants respond to the temperature they're exposed to every day. And we can instantly turn a plant on to promote elongation by going to positive diff. We can instantly turn a plant down by going to negative diff. We don't have a lag. It happens instantaneously on a day-by-day -day basis. Now, we've done a lot of pictures on Easter lilies, some pictures on mums. What we found, what John found, um, was that most plants respond to diff. Here's an experiment that was conducted on chrysanthemum. Up in the upper left, we have our plus 12 degrees diff here. Down on the bottom, we have minus 12 degrees. And what you see is this continuum. The tallest plants are in the most positive diff, the most compact plants under the most negative diff. When we line these plants up, these plants at this particular um, comparison, these drop right across here intentionally. The plants grow in 12, 16, 20, the same zero diff. Final height is the same. Notice a little more height on the plants grown at 24 degrees here. And the reason for that is if we go in one, two, three, four, we count the internodes. High temperatures delay flower induction in the short day plant chrysanthemum. And so the internode length here on all these plants on average is the same. This plant wound up being a little taller in total, not because internode length was longer, but because we had more internodes. Here's this comparison, minus 12, plus 12. And one of the neat things that John did is he took and cut those internodes and he lined them up. And what you can see, we just go here, we see these zero diff internodes are, since, are all the same, plus four, plus eight, plus 12, and so on. So again, diff controls internode length. We can have t additional temperature responses, um, as we saw back here, um, with more internodes with delayed induction, uh, delayed flowering with high temperature, but diff controls the difference, the relationship controls final internode length. A few other plants. Um, this is an extreme. I've got a few extreme pictures here, 30-20, uh, 30-10, uh, 10-30. Um, this is dianthus. Um, again, chlorosis short versus tall and darker green. Fuchsia, same type of response. What we also normally find is that um, you can also have photoperiod responses at elongation. Long days, we tend to get a taller plant than under short days with the same diff relationship. So here's a long day plant. Uh, here's the short day plant down here. And here we have the long day plants. But typically, the longer the day, the taller the plant will be for the same diff temperature. That was alive. Plugs, young seedlings respond likewise. Here we see Dusty Miller, Impatience, Pansy. Notice 25, 15, 15, 25. Again, differences in height, um, very pronounced. Geranium, same story. Notice the long internode length there on the petioles even compared to a plant grown with a negative diff. And here we see the plants finishing um, when grown at the same average temperature, flower the same time, positive diff taller, negative diff shorter. So um, even uh, here's syngonium, uh, many of our foliage plants. So this seems to be a, almost a universal response across plants. One of the places we don't see much of a response um, are, I'll say, uh, rosette type plants. We don't see much of a difference like on a Gerbera, a plant that has the meristem right near the, the soil. What we know it's the meristem that's important to see the temperature differences. Um, and if your meristem is right near the soil, or if we have something like a tulip or a hyacinth, they don't respond to diff, but most terrestrial plants in our experience respond to this difference between day and night temperature. 
Now, many of you likely will have heard of something called dip or drop, uh, or morning temperature uh, drop in temperature to control stem elongation. Um, one of the things that we observed was that it seemed that the plant response to temperature was strongest uh, for, to control elongation when plants were exposed to cool temperatures immediately at sunrise. This was a great experiment that John conducted. And so what he did is he grew all these plants at 20 degrees night temperature. So all four of these plants have the same night temperature. This plant would be a classic zero diff plant. Okay? So 20, 20, and I'll put 20 too low. We'll put 20 down here. So night temperature 20, first two hours of the day were 20 degrees, and then the second seven hours. So this was a nine hour day, um, and then a uh, 15 hour night that these plants were growing. So when we had a zero diff, we had a plant that was this tall. When we have a classic negative diff, so this was 20 degrees night temperature, 12, 12, 12 degrees during the day, we have a short, temp a short plant. What was interesting, what was interesting was exposing plants to only two hours of low temperature at sunrise resulted in a significant decrease in plant height. And this was the basis of what we call temperature dip, or the Europeans, um, Rohr Moo, Dr. Rohr Moo, Professor Moo from um, the University of Norway, he used the term drop. That's how we came up with the concept of dropping the temperatures first thing in the morning to help control elongation. So we see that this plant is not as, this plant here is not as short as this plant, but we've had a significant reduction by only two hours change in temperature at sunrise. So that's the concept behind um, and the basis behind the diff drop term that you'll hear for growing plants. So let's summarize this whole process on um, what we know about temperature. For a fixed night temperature, internode elongation increases as day temperature increases. And here's our picture that showed that. We looked at this before. Night, day, night temperature fixed, day temperature we're increasing in height as day temperature increases. For a fixed day temperature, internode elongation decreases as temperature increases. So it's the reverse when we change night temperature. And this was the example that we looked at. Decrease in height as our night temperature increases when our day temperature is fixed. We said final internode length is similar when the diff difference between day and night is the same. And we looked at this particular picture here where we had plants that are very, with the same day-night temperature relationship. And again, same height. We said that final internode length increases as diff increases. So we talked now internode, not the total plant. And here we looked at this picture where as we go from minus 12 to plus 12 for each one of these internodes, we see an increase. And within a diff, similar final length. Finally, a reduction in temperature at sunrise. Remember that drop at sunrise, so-called dip, dip, or drop. Stimulates a strong negative diff response. Not as strong as if we have continuous dark, but a strong response nonetheless. So these are the principles behind, and the background behind how plants respond to day and night temperature, so-called diff. There we go. Greatest reduction occurs with the large negative diff. Um, maybe that's the, the, the key point when we're trying to control elongation. And this is the plant that um, quite, quite significant here um, when we have this large negative diff. Nothing stops us as a grower from having a large difference between the day and night. Some people I encounter says, oh, we can't change the temperature more than a couple degrees during the day, and we have to work our way down. This poppycock. Um, we can change from 3010 to 1030 and the plants respond um, to what's happening in that day night uh, temperature combination. Let's move on to a tool that we call graphical tracking that utilizes, often utilizes um, diff or can utilize diff in addition to growth regulators to achieve final height. It's a height control management tool is what, we, what I refer to it as. 
We first introduced this in 1987, so it's been around a long time. And probably the, one of the most satisfying things in my professional life was a grower who came to me when he started using graphical tracking, and he said, it allows me to sleep at night. I may be tall, my, my crop may be tall, my crop may be short, but I know that, and when I know that, I can sleep because I know I can apply tools to get it to the proper height. When I first started visiting growers back when we were starting to do this research, I'd visit a grower and they would show me a poinsettia crop, or so it'd be a lily crop, and they'd say, what do you think? How's my height? And you know, we'd sort of look at it, oh, yeah, so I guess it looks, it looks, looks a little tall or oh, looks a little short. We really didn't know. We were doing this so-called you know, seat of the pants growing for height at that time. Graphical tracking changed that all. So graphical tracking is a process where we manage or monitor, we monitor height over time. We plot that height that we monitor on a graph and compare it with a target height curve over time. We use it to determine if plants are growing too slowly or elongating, maybe it'd be a better term, elongating too slowly or too quickly. And it helps us to determine when to apply either a growth retardant or to change our diff temperature to achieve our final desired plant height. This all started with, some re with the work that Miriam Carlson had done. And she had grown plants under 15 different day temperature, night temperature combinations. And when we plotted out the lateral shoot length versus time, we got this wide range in final height and timing to flower. Here we had plants flowering in 60 days, here we had plants flowering in 90 days, we had plants that were very compact, and we had plants that were very tall. We did something with that data. We took and normalized it. And what that means is we scaled it from zero to one, zero to one. So the original data shows up here, and when we scaled all these different curves from zero to one, we wound up finding that all these plants grew very similarly. They had the so-called uh, curve that we ultimately, a nonlinear equation we called a Gompertz function, but basically every plant started, had a slow lag period, a rapid growth phase, and as it came into flower, it um, became asymptotic, it stopped growing here at the end. From this graph, from this graph, we developed the graphical tracking curve for, for chrysanthemum. At about the same time, Robert Gage, here's uh, now at Penn State University, a professor at Penn State University. Rob was working on poinsettias, and I was having him work on the day and night temperature, and he likewise moved plants, except Rob one-upped John. Remember John had five by five treatment combinations? Well, John had, or excuse me, Rob had one, two, three, four, five, six greenhouse sections. Six times six, he was moving plants, had 36 different treatment combinations. And we were steady in flower induction, flowering, and stem elongation. And um, this is where we originally showed that the night temperature was most important under natural photoperiodic, or under short day photoperiodic conditions for flower induction in the poinsettia. But when we looked at all the treatment combinations, we saw the same thing in poinsettia that we'd seen in the other crops we'd studied. And so here's a poinsettia plant at flower growing with a warm day and cool night versus a cool day and warm night. And we see exactly the same response that we saw in chrysanthemum and lilies, that positive diff promoted elongation, negative diff inhibited elongation. Rob had collected height over time and also looked at final height at anthesis, and when he looked at how diff affected the poinsettia, he said, found exactly the same thing that we had seen in, in other crops. He also found that when we measured that stem elongation over time, that the curve of poinsettia elongation was identical to that to chrysanthemum. So we have this curve where slow elongation initially after pinch, followed by this rapid elongation phase, and then the plateau phase at the end of the crop. It was from th these two curves, we developed our graphical tracking curves for poinsettia as well as, I'll say, florist chrysanthemum. A little later, we'll talk about garden mums because we tweaked that curve over time. But for poinsettia and florist chrysanthemum, we create the curve by starting with a pinching date, our flowering date. We want to know what the initial height is of the main shoot at the time of pinch, that's the pot plus the height of the main shoot. 
We want to know what their plant height is at finish. Most everyone says, I, I have a final height for this plant. I want it 16 to 18 inches, 15 to 17, whatever that happens to be. These are our minimum and maximum height. And then finally, we've got to know what our stem elongation curve is. How do we get from uh, here to here? What's that curve look like? This is what a typical graphical tracking curve, uh, generalized graphical tracking curve would look at. So again, our pinch date, flowering date here, go from here to here. We start with our initial plant height. We have our pot plus our plant. And then we have our desired minimum and maximum at flower. And then, of course, now we have this curve that we've talked about. So this is a classic graphical tracking curve. For some of you that may have been around a while, you've probably heard of uh, what's called the late curve for poinsettias. The standard curve has these percentages by relative time from pinch to flower. Back when we developed this so-called standard curve, um, it worked very well until a variety of poinsettia came along called Freedom. Freedom's not grown anymore, that I'm, at least that I'm aware of, um, but Freedom had a unique uh, characteristic, and that characteristic was, as it was growing along towards flower, when the crop closed in, when the, when the leaves started overlapping, the last, especially three weeks of the crop, sometimes as little as two weeks of the crop, plants, the canopy closed in, the far red stimulation of elongation that occurs in plants resulted in this plant, so it might be coming over, and all of a sudden it'd go, zoop, it would go, it would have this big push of growth before it finally leveled off. If we were following the so-called standard curve, what we'd often wind up doing is the crop would be coming up here, then it would suddenly grow up and we would overshoot our final height. That's where this so-called late curve came because what we did is we pushed down our height early in the crop so that as we came up here, if it decided to poof, poof, poof up, we had some room, some elongation for it um, so it wouldn't finish too tall. How do we measure these plants? How do we do this? Generally, the recommendation, try and measure five average plants a couple times a week. And choose plants that represent the entire population of plants you're dealing with. Um, if your crop is variable, split it into two populations. Separate those plants out, but track typical plants. Some of the tools I've collected, pictures the tools I've collected over the years for measuring these heights. Some are very simple. Here we have simply a piece of paper wrapped around a, um, a ruler. Um, here, Ed Silvius was at Green Circle Growers. Ed made this fancy little gizmo that he could twist and slide up and down. And he could read the height of the, uh, in this case, Easter lilies. Um, here, Jim Mast, a piece of cardboard on a, a ruler or a yardstick. Um, piece of pipe. Um, set it down. Look at what the number is here. So there's lots of different ways we can do it, but once we get those numbers, we start plotting them out. Here's an actual example of an early crop that was graphical tracked, a six inch poinsettia, had a high spec of 14 to 16 inches, you can see out here, uh, had that high spec of 14 to 16. As it started growing, not unusually in late September, there was this pulse and this elongation exceeded our curve here. And this particular grower applied Cycocell here, slowed the growth, down and then as you all know, growth regulators, unless they're excessively applied, the plants grow out of them and so this plant started growing again and the grower saw this coming. He said, you know what? If it grew from here to here, this measurement, if I don't do something, most likely it's gonna be up here next measurement. So we can anticipate, so we applied a growth regulator and so we worked our way, perhaps over applied there and by late October, um, the plants were shorter than desired. He was concerned uh, about the crop, moved it to positive diff, and the positive diff promoted elongation, and the crop finished within the desired height window that we have out here. So by graphical tracking, by measuring our crop, over time, we can see and compare it with a, a standard that we were looking for. This is our graphical tracking curve, and apply growth regulators, apply diff to either slow growth down or promote elongation. Um, so we wind up where we want at the end of the crop. Most growers will take and put some type of graph in their greenhouse. Um, and here we see a, uh, a graph um, on a crop that's finishing. Um, and I can actually say this person didn't start very early, but they did wind up um, achieving their, their goal. I made a comment about temperature timing. Um, positive diff, negative diff, 
Um, how did we reach that conclusion that if we have the same average temperature that the plant develops at the same rate? And this came about from the data that we collected back when we were doing this work on the Easter lilies. And we collected um, leaf unfolding rate, leaves per day, versus average temperature. And then plotted it out based upon the green points here. These represent constant zero diff environments. Then we have the red, which represent positive diff, and the triangles represent negative diff. And what we found is it doesn't matter how we deliver temperature to a plant. If we deliver a particular average daily temperature um, with a warm day and a cool night, or so if we look at these points here, warm day, cool night, cool day, warm night, doesn't matter. As long as the average temperature comes out the same, our development rate is the same. So it's one of the neat things about using diff and graphical tracking and, um, is we can achieve the same average temperature. If we achieve the average, same average temperature, we will achieve the same rate of development. This was a, for the, those involved in growing Easter lilies, so-called isopleth graph um, contour plot. What we looked at was creating lines that represented the same leaf unfolding rate over different day and night temperature combinations. And so this line here, 24 day and about 21 night, results in a um, average temperature that results in two leaves per day unfolding, a positive diff, 24, 21. If we look at a cool day, 18, 27 here, we have the same leaf unfolding rate, but we have a shorter, more compact plant. So maturation, the rate of progress to flower, is a function of average temperature. How we deliver the temperature to get that influences whether we have a tall plant or whether we have a shorter plant. Another example of graphical tracking using temperature and diff, this is for Easter lilies. Again, we start with our um, emergence date. We have our flowering date. In the case of lilies, um, we can use um, an inflection point at visible bud. And so we create this graphical tracking curve. And this is, this is actually a data from the first graphical tracking uh, crop. Um, this was done by Andy Mass back in the day, his actual plant temperature. Down here we see his use of diff. In those days he was learning how to manage diff. Started off, saw the plants were tall, went to a fairly strong negative diff. And notice that, oh, they're getting, sh oh, <laughs> they're getting too short. Sort of knee jerk to a very positive diff and promoted elongation and then came to a um, less positive or to a less negative diff, but a, a diff that resulted in the crop finishing on, um, on time and at the right height. And so this was an example of managing diff um, to achieve the final desired height. Some other graphical tracking examples, I mentioned um, garden mums. Typically with a garden mum, we will use a straight line because often we sell garden mums before they reach full flower. When we developed the uh, original graphical tracking curve for chrysanthemum, it was placed upon an open flower, full open flower. Um, garden mums, typically we sell just cracking color, and so a straight line is adequate. Um, as we see here, there is a little slow off of growth here, but basically all we have to do is go from our pinch date to our flower date, make a straight line, and it works good enough. It's easy and it works good enough. Some people have actually tweaked the graphical tracking process. They say, I don't want to do a graph. I want to visually see how plants are growing in my greenhouse. And this is pretty slick here. <clears throat> this grower has taken uh, little um, pieces of plastic, wrote the week of the year, 36, 38, 40, and how tall this crop should be from that graphical tracking curve. And so as you're standing in the greenhouse, you can look at the crop, you can see where what week you are, you can see if the plant's taller or shorter and adjust accordingly. Here he's put in, these are my min and max that I want for my, my crop. And so it becomes an easy visual tool, uh, gets you in the same place. Doesn't give you the line, the slope of the line, but it works, um, it can work well. And here we see the same type of um, figure again. Uh, pretty, pretty sweet um, as a method uh, to help with height control and management in a poinsettia crop in this case. What software, what tools are out there to actually um, help with graphical tracking? Um, 
there originally, uh, the Ecke Ranch, when it was still in, um, still a company, they had a um, program. Duman purchased the company, and they've created an on-target guide that for their uh, so-called for their or on-target um, program. Uh, it's a mobile app. It can be downloaded off the internet and used for graphical tracking. Um, so uh, some growers use this and they use their app for um, graphical tracking their poinsettia crop. Uh, Paul Fisher, who did a lot of work with me on graphical tracking and decision support at one time, uh, had created a, a, a slick program um, that he no longer supports. Um, so it's, it's a little unfortunate, but um, it does show you what you can create if you wanted to create something yourself. As Paul said, this can be hacked. This can be, um, uh, this doesn't necessarily work in, from 2011 and all versions of Excel now, so we stopped supporting it. But here we see a, the standard curve, we see the late curve, we see a, a so-called um, unpinched curve. And in general, for an unpinched poinsettia, we can use a straight line, and then we can do custom curves. So one can do this, and if we go to this booklet, this goes back, woohoo, back to 1990. Um, this is a series of articles that um, well, we published um, John Irwin, Miriam Carlson, Paul Fisher, myself, um, we published these articles. I will provide a copy of this book to the American Floral Endowment, and if you reach out to them and ask them, they can supply this uh, scanned copy because it's no longer available. So you can read some of the um, experiences that um, and this, this information that we've talked about today. And then finally, there's another program a um, little program, just simple um, uh, spreadsheet that Paul Fish has put together where um, you can put in a few key dates and either use these graphs or use these percentages um, here or adjust them as you wish and create your own graphical tracking curves if you so choose. So this will also be available from the American Floral Endowment. So that's my story today. Be happy to answer any questions that you might have. All right. First off, I want to say thank you. That was that was an awesome presentation. Um, as a grower myself, I know I'll be using a lot of those tools to implement here in the greenhouse and understanding how they actually work and the research that went behind it was was incredible. So I'm going to go ahead. We got a bunch of questions here in the chat. I'm going to go ahead and start going through some of them. Um, so first one I have is, is diff cost effective versus using only PGRs given the cost of heating during the winter months? This is a really good question. Um, it's been asked since the first time we started presenting information on DIFF. And what, what I'll say is that um, the location that one is in the country, the amount of solar radiation you have, the time of the year uh, can influence the efficacy of using, um, I'll say, negative dip for height control. So for example, back when we were in Michigan in months of late October, November, December, January, February, seems like went on forever, had long, cold, cloudy days. And a greenhouse with a curtain that could be pulled at night, um, it was more cost effective to have a negative diff than a positive diff because there was very little thermal radiation during the day. And if you had a warm day, uh, you lost more heat during the day than um, you saved at night by having a cool night with the curtain. So um, climates that have cloudy weather, um, typically we find that um, you can um, find cost savings. Um, if you have a, th a blanket thermal curtain that you can pull at night if it's cloudy. Places that are sunny. Um, you know, I lived in uh, Michigan, it was cloudy weather there. We live now in Colorado get a lot of solar radiation during the day. And the uh, probability of having it more cost effective to use negative diff in Colorado is less than what would have happened in, in Michigan. Still, the idea of maintaining closer to a zero diff versus a positive diff um, will help with height control. As you remember those graphs that uh, were shown, um, the, the big difference in um, stimulation elongation occurs when you go from positive diff to zero diff. You see less response from zero to say a strong negative diff, but nonetheless, um, uh, a zero diff uh, or trying to control day and night similar um, 
can be beneficial. And it will depend perhaps on the species, but overall, um, I, I like the use of diff for control, especially on plants where if we were to spray them, we could get delay in flowering associated with the growth rate later falling on the flower buds. Okay. Awesome. Thank you. So another question I have here, um, I know you touched on some of them throughout the presentation, um, but what, what other plants would you say don't work well with diff? Um, and is there like a resource that somebody might be able to refer to to see which ones won't work well? You know, there's, again, a very good question. The few, there are very few plants that we don't see a response. The major plants that we haven't seen a response are the uh, plants that have a meristem near the soil. Um, uh, for example, tulips, hyacinths, narcissus, the Dutch bulbs, we don't find uh, to re particularly respond to diff. Um, when we have a plant um, that has the meristem at the soil, it becomes more problematic to uh, change the temperature because the sensing, the sensing location uh, for temperature uh, to get this uh, response is at the meristem. And when we got a rosette type plant, uh, we tend to get less response. Although um, if we have a long enough um, uh, low temperature during the day and warm temperature at night, we still can get some response like on a Gerbera um, or a Cyclamen, but the rosette plants tend to uh, have less response. And certainly the Dutch bulbs um, have essentially no response to um, positive or negative diff. Is it uh, possible to compensate uh, diff by using nutrition? I'm trying to think of that question, what, what is exactly being asked. Um, so the only nutrient um, for growing a plant, I'll say more or less healthy, that affects stem elongation is phosphorus. Um, Paul Nelson and his students, his uh, postdocs and individuals working with Paul several years ago at North Carolina State, clearly showed that lower rates of phosphorus gave a shorter, more compact plant. Um, in, in, in my world of talking with growers, if I'm gonna grow a, a plug or a liner, I look to grow with um, somewhere in the neighborhood of six to eight parts per million phosphorus in the nutrient solution. Uh, finished crops, 12 to 14 parts per million, because we typically want a little more elongation. Uh, part of the reason why when we use like 20, 10, 20, we get a lot of elongation is because typically at the rates of nitrogen we use, we deliver um, 15, 20, 30, 40 parts per million phosphorus and high phosphorus promotes stem elongation in almost every plant that, that we know. So can we use nutrition uh, within limits? We can, um, we can use phosphorus. Um, the more we limit phosphorus, the shorter the stem elongation or the less the stem elongation will be. And the uh, more that um, we deliver phosphorus, the greater it will be. So hopefully that helps. So I, I have a, an, a, question, a question here from an attendee regarding um, what different uh, durations would be for a day and a night. And I think you mostly covered the question. Um, if, if I didn't, if somebody could respond back in the chat, but the, the charts that you provided with the different uh, diff amounts, the day and night temperatures and like the amount of growth, is there a way that we could have access to those charts or are they available somewhere? I, I'd, I'd be happy to, to supply that, sure. Okay, awesome. Yeah. All right. So I know you also briefly talked about uh, using curtains um, and blanket covers and whatnot. Could you talk a little bit more about the way to optimize uh, a system set up uh, for energy savings um, and optimal diff as well? Uh, that, that's a, a really good question um, as well. And, and, and um, if we have a curtain system and it's cold outside and we're looking to drop our temperature and we're trying to minimize the loss of energy, um, that we will experience when we cool the, the temperature off in the morning. Um, what I find, especially if we have a heating system that's based upon hot water. So I'm gonna go a couple different directions here. Um, hot water heating systems, there's a lot of energy in the pipes. And if we, um, I'm gonna even back up further. The ideal world is we drop our temperature at sunrise, okay? When the plant perceives light. Um, so anywhere from the astronomical sunrise to 15 to 20 minutes before that is when the ideal time to have our temperature dropping to get the greatest plant response. 
if we have water, hot water in our pipes, and we set our heating set point down right at that moment, it's going to be a lot of energy that we're going to blow out of the greenhouse. So in that case, ideally about um, 45 minutes to an hour before sunrise, astronomical sunrise, we lower our heating set point. So that heat can dissipate out of those pipes into the greenhouse. Then at sunrise, or uh, let's say we'll say right at astronomical uh, sunrise, we open our curtains and then we let the cool air above the curtains fall on the crop and the temperature drops. We don't lose that heat that was in the pipes that otherwise would have been lost. If we're using a, um, like a Modine heater or using a, a hot, um, a, forced air heating system like, like we typically would think with the Modine. We can run our temperatures right up essentially close to the time we open our curtains because there's no extra heat. There's essentially no heat left in the heat exchanger in those heaters. And so we can shut them off, we can drop or open our curtains, drop the temperature and get a strong response. That is how I would approach, um, especially in a cloudy climate, how I'd approach use of um, uh, our temperature set points. Um, if anything, lower the heating set point, 30 minutes to an hour before sunrise, and then open your curtains at sunrise. Awesome. Okay. I think that's, that's great advice. I'm, I'm sure we use that here as well. Um, so I got a couple more questions here. Hopefully we'll be able to squeeze them in. Um, will you be able to comment on the effects of the root system when using negative dips? Uh, that's on the root system. Um, I'm just pondering way back. Um, I don't believe I can share that there's any particular difference in how root performance is under um, negative versus positive diff. Um, there, one might predict a little less photosynthesis um, because we, on negative diff, because we have a, uh, a plant that has less chlorophyll and we know that root systems will be larger with higher light and higher photosynthesis, um, but it's never become an issue in growing plants using negative diff, for example, or temperature drop versus, um, I'll say, a positive diff environment. Awesome. All right, and then the last question here. For over 35 years of growers using diff, have you ever seen any negative effects from using it? No. <laughs> I've got to think. Uh, no, um, I have not. I have not. Um, uh, that's a, that, 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 that makes me sit and think, but um, I'm, I'm sure someone out there will say, Royal, I did this or I found that and um, something will come about. But um, no, I've not, I've not seen any. There's nothing that's raised its head. That's the raised its ugly head uh, that will keep me from using um, negative depth. For sure, um, as we look forward to the future, um, who knows what's going to happen with energy prices. Um, and for sure, those that are in the uh, uh, sunny environments, um, a temperature drop gives you the opportunity to get some of that benefit uh, right at sunrise and then still let your temperature rise up later in the day and get some of that thermal time as we, as we discussed um, with the crop. Okay. Awesome. All right. Well, we're going to go ahead and wrap it up. I'd uh, like to thank you again, um, Dr. Royal Hines, and thank you for everyone, all of our attendees for joining us today for another session of AFE's Grow Pro webinar series. Uh, we hope you don't join us next month for Dr. J.C. Chong's session on new technology and pesticides for flower crops on Tuesday, September 27th at 1 p.m. Eastern time. You can register at endowment.org slash growpro. While you're there, check out our past webinar recordings, other grower-related resources, and research reports available to you for free, thanks to industry support. We ask that you please complete a brief survey about today's session where you can suggest additional topics and help us continue to improve these webinars in the future. Thank you again for joining us and have a great day, everyone. Goodbye.